Hello. Everything should be set up now. Um, let's see, does it seem okay? Do you see me? Do you hear me and see the desktop? Yeah. Yeah, everything's fine. Great, thanks. Okay, so um, first, there's one last reading assignment uh, for 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 uh, this, this is the last week of semester. It's one last reading assignment up here, and today we're going to continue talking about uh, virtual page, uh, virtual memory using paging. Okay, and uh, we'll we'll talk we'll explain a little bit more about virtual memory, and then go back to the homework assignment and say more about this homework assignment because we'll we'll explain a couple a little bit more about what this assignment is doing after we've explained a little bit more about virtual memory today. Okay, so let me just get it ready. Professor, are we going to have a review for the final? Yeah, that I, I, I was working on that last night. I think it's almost ready. Okay, it'll be a little bit of stuff about virtual memory. So it's going to be some questions about virtual memory. Okay, and okay. Um, yeah, I'll try to get that up later today. Okay, and I, um, I haven't looked at the final exam schedule yet to see what day this class's exam is supposed to be on. Um, I think it's on Monday at 1230. I, I put the schedule up on my other class. Okay, here's the final exam schedule. We meet, what is it, Monday at, we'd be this block here. Is that right? Is that what you said? So we, the exam is supposedly Monday? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Monday from uh, 1230 to 2.30. Yeah, that's a week from today then. So yeah. That's a week from today. And it'll it, it, um, it'll be like, it won't be in that time frame. It'll be like the last exam. So you'll have the whole day to do it. Okay. So it'll be on Monday and you'll have the day to do it. It'll, it'll, be, do, it'll be done just like the last exam. Okay. So it'll be a week from today and it'll be just like the last exam and the review should hopefully be up there later today because I was working on it last night. And it'll be about so questions about virtual memory. Okay, all right. So, okay, now, and, and also people have written to me emails asking questions about their grades. I'm, I'm working on those. I'm trying to get through everything. I, 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 I've been making progress, but it, it takes, it, it, it's just me just, you know, Thanks for being patient. I, I have just a lot of stuff that I have to get through. So I'll try to answer every email, but it's gonna take a little while for me to get through everything. Okay. So if you have questions about your grade, send me an email and I'll try to answer it, it, it when I can. Okay. All right. So um, let's see, any, any other, anybody have a question about the homework right away? You know, is there anything like anything seem funny? Anybody have an important question they want to ask about the homework? Have they had time to look at it yet? Anything about the homework yet? Okay, we'll we'll play around with it more today and do a little, talk a little bit more about in detail about it today. But if yeah, you know, if you have questions about it, please you know just send me email or come to office hours. But okay, so first now let's. Uh, um, Okay, so, all right. So what we're gonna do today is, is continue with the next part about virtual memory. This is the, uh, the reading that was for today. Beyond physical memory is the name of the chapter. Okay, so what, what that means is we're gonna add to the picture we did. Okay, here's the picture we did, where is it? Here's the picture we drew yesterday in last week. Okay. Physical memory is over here. Each process has its own sense of what virtual memory looks like. Okay, so each process has its own idea of what virtual memory looks like. And the, the processes pages, if it's virtual memory, are actually sitting over here in frames in physical memory. And remember, a process's page table tells the memory management unit, the page table is the memory management unit, how to translate an address in that page goes to 
that frame over here. See, so page zero, when you get an address from page zero, you look over here in slot zero of the address table, of the uh, page table, and it says go to page three in physical memory. So then an address to, from in this block, this page, becomes an address in this page, okay? On your hand, if it, this program wants to access its stack, it goes over here and says, well, the stack is in page one. Page one was in frame one. So an address, an offset, what we called an offset, like if you want the 10th byte in this page, it would be the 10th byte in this page, okay? In your hand, the heap is over here in page five. So the 100th byte in this heap is actually the 100th byte over here in this guy here, okay? So an address, a virtual address does two things. It chooses what page you're in and chooses what byte in that page. So a virtual address has two parts, the part that picks the page and the part that picks the offset. And we, we drew that as a picture also. Yeah, you know, a virtual address was in two parts. Yeah. So you think of the bits of the virtual address as being cut into two, two sections of the bits, the page number section and the offset section, okay? The page number is used to look up an index in the page table and the offset is then used to figure out how far into that page you are, okay? So the first half of an address is used as an index into the page table. And this was certain, well, they're not divided, it's not half. The first part of an address is used as an index into the page table. The first part of an address is the page number. Then the second part is how far in the page, you know, what is it, are you looking at the hundredth byte or the 200th byte or the 300th byte of that page? That part just gives you the same, just gives you the hundredth byte or 200th byte of that page over there, okay? All right, so that's the basics of paging. The, the advantage of it is that there's no fragmentation. You know, memory over here is never fragmented. If, if the uh, red process goes away and frees up that block, that block, and that block, and another process wants to come in, you don't have to move anybody around. You can just assign their pages to these frames. Since pages and frames all have the same size, you, you never have little slivers of memory you know, remember the, the, the fragmentation was this picture we had over here where you had slivers of memory between allocated parts of memory. You had free pieces of memory. There were all different sizes all over the place. That's called fragmentation. That was the big disadvantage of the page of the segment and base and bounds type memory system. There's no real way to avoid having random amounts of memory between processes. Okay, you don't get random amounts of memory between processes here because you only can have pages between, you, know, you only have, if, if memory is free, you have free pages and all pages are the exact same size. So if a new process comes along and it needs three pages, you just look for three free pages over here. And they don't have to be any, they can be anywhere in physical memory because the page table can point to any one of these. So these three blocks here don't have to be contiguous. The code can be over here, the stack is up here, and the heap is down here. And this virtual pro this program here, as far as it knows, that's just continuous memory. It could just step through memory from that address to that address and be fine. That's just continuous memory. When it's you remember, when it crosses that boundary, it'll actually jump from that address to that address up there magically. You know, it, it, but the pro process won't know that. But when addresses cross that boundary between that page frame and that, between that page and that page, when addresses cross that boundary, they actually jump from the bottom of that page to the top of that page, page frame, from the bottom of that page frame to the top of that page frame. So it's really kind of uh, amazing. From the point of view of the process, it has no way of knowing that it's, it's, that its code and data are scattered all over physical memory. And that's the way it really is. It, when you run a program on Windows, your program is just splattered all over physical memory, and it doesn't slow you down in any way. Okay. The, the operating system just puts the pieces of your program anywhere it can find room in physical memory, and so your, your code and stack and heap can just appear anywhere over here in physical memory. Okay. Now, in this picture, we didn't use the disk drive. 
and now we're gonna the, the that's the beyond physical memory the the chapter here when it says beyond physical memory means to add the disk drive into the picture so that's what we're going to do today is we're going to extend this picture to make use of the disk drive the only thing we said over here was that the disk drive is cut up into sectors and these sectors are the same size as the pages so these pages and these page frames and these sectors are all the same size. That's the only thing we mentioned about memory the other day. We haven't actually used it yet. Okay. So now let's let's start talking about how we would use memory, how we use the disk drive. So I've got another picture. What we're going to talk about is uh, is sometimes referred to as demand paging. Okay, the uh, I don't remember if the book even used that phrase. No, they didn't. Yeah, they don't even use that phrase. This what we're going to talk about is quite often referred to as demand paging. Okay, and it's got its own, okay. Demand paging is a form of paging that is making use of both the, what we've been talking about so far and throws in the uh, hard drive to it. I'm surprised, it's kind of weird that our textbook doesn't even use the phrase demand paging because that's a pretty common term for what they're talking about when they talk about beyond physical memory, this idea of mechanisms, okay. So here's, the, here's, here's how we're gonna, what we're gonna do. We start off with your code sitting on the hard drive. Remember your exe files on the hard drive. And we've seen that since the beginning of the semester. We said that uh, like notepad.exe is just a file on the hard drive. So here's the code for, this would be the, uh, the exe file for this program would be these blue things here. So one program would be this code and this data. And another program would be these two blocks of code. Okay, so that's a fi th these three blocks would be a file on the hard drive, and these two blocks would be a fi another file on the hard drive. And we're going to make a process out of this, so we're going to make a process out of this. And I'll explain in a minute what this swap thing down here is. And then there's another file on the hard drive that's a DLL. This is one. Remember, this is one of the dynamic link libraries, the shared libraries that Windows uses. Okay, so if we looked on our computer, like on my computer, if we looked at the Windows System 32 folder, the famous System 32 folder, it's full of DLLs and EXE files, okay, programs and dynamic link libraries. So they're just files on the hard drive, okay. So we're going to see a little, so this would be one file on the hard drive. This would be another, this would be an EXE file on the hard drive. This would be another one, okay. Now, suppose we want to run this program, okay. We're going to run it as process one. So here's what the, op, here's how, how the operating system works. The operating system is going to put the code, say, in. Oh, I need to open this in. Um, I, need, I want to draw on it, so I'm going to open it in Paint. Okay. So the operating system says I'm going to create a pros. I'm going to create a virtual memory space for running this blue program. So I want to run this blue program and want to create a, I'm going to create a process for it. And the operating system is going to put the code say right here. Okay, I'll make it blue. So the operating system is going to decide that the code is going to be in that frame, that page. Okay, so this would be over here. Okay, now here's what's going to be interesting. We, before we would put that somewhere in physical memory, okay? Here's what we're gonna do. Page zero, we're gonna mark it as valid. Remember this bit tells us that the page is a valid memory address, okay? Now before we would pick a page frame for it, but right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, it's, there's, there's a new bit here called present. We're gonna say that this page is not present in memory yet. And the number here will be the sector on the hard drive where it is. So I'll put a number two here. 
but that's actually not page frame number, that's sector number. See, I gave all the sectors a number, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Giving the sectors numbers like that actually has its own name. That's called linear block addressing. Okay, so it's called logical block addressing or linear block addressing. It's the idea that you give every block on the hard drive a number that just starts at the beginning of the hard drive and goes to the end. It's not actually used much anymore, but it's, it used to be used for hard drives. So we can imagine that every hard, every sector in the hard drive has a linear block address, okay? So I gave the sectors in the hard drive linear block addresses. And then over here in the page table, if I have a page of virtual memory that's supposed to be valid, but I haven't yet put it in physical memory, it's still on the hard drive. I mark it as valid, but not present. And then I put the address of it on the hard drive in here, okay? Now my program needs also a stack segment. So the stack segment will be here. Now the stack's not in the hard drive. Stack is, is, is just data in memory. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say that this, I'm gonna put the stack say over here. This program stack will be present and valid. And it'll be now in block one, page one, page frame one. Okay. So now the page table can either direct me to the hard drive or direct me to physical memory. V being one means that that page in virtual memory really is being used. That's valid. The other bit says whether it's actually in memory or it's still on the hard drive. That's present. Present meaning actually in physical memory. Okay. Now over here, I'll put the heap. Okay. Now the heap has, the heap's not from the hard drive. Your, your exe files don't have a copy of the stack and a copy of the heap in them. The programs build their stack and heap as they're running. So the operating system, when it starts my program, will decide to put the heap Okay, we'll see. We'll we'll put the well, I'll put the heap say here. I mean, it's just I'm I'm just kind of choosing random places to put these in, in physical memory. The heap now will be valid, present, and it's present in frame three. Okay. Now this is loading the program into memory. The program is being loaded, okay? It hasn't been started running yet, okay? Now at some point, the operating system jumps to the code, okay? And it says, oh, I have to start executing this program. So address zero needs to be fetched to start executing the code. When the program starts executing the code, it goes over here and says, okay, I translate block zero to, oh, sector two. Okay, the sector's on the hard drive. That's called a page fault. A page fault is when the computer wants to access a page. It's present, but it's, it's valid, but not present. The page is valid. It's valid to access it, but it's not yet in physical memory. It's in the hard drive. That's called a page fault. The operating system now needs to go fetch the page and bring it into physical memory. So at this point, when I when I first, this is called touching the page. When I first touch that page, the, op, the operating system realizes, oh, I allocated that page, but I didn't really allocate it. I just pretended to allocate it. It's valid, but not present. It's still on the hard drive. So right now the operating system says, well, okay, now it's time for me to bring it into the physical memory. So the operating system decides, oh, I'll bring it over here. So the code will be brought over here. That's page frame five. Now the code's gonna change the present bit. I have to go over here now and erase the present bit. I'm gonna update it from, from not present to present. And I'm gonna update it from being on the hard drive at sector two to be in a frame at frame 
So what we just did there is a, what's called a page fault. We handled a page fault. A page fault is when the virtual memory system says that a page is valid, so you can use it, but it's not present. So that means it's on the hard drive, not actually in physical memory. When, then that means you have to bring it from the hard drive into physical memory, okay? And then mark the update the page table to say that it's present and that this thing now is its page frame number. Oh, and see now, right now this thing here is uh, free. This one is free and this one is free. That means that these ones are not valid. So over here, this would be marked as not valid, not valid, and not valid, okay? That means that whatever numbers in here is meaningless. See, they're not valid. And it, whatever bits are over here, meaningless too. If this bit, the valid bit is zero, nothing else in that page table entry means anything. That means that these pages are not in use. Now that means if my program accidentally accesses that page, my program crashes because it'll be accessing an invalid page. That's called a segment fault. Now there's two kinds of faults here, page fault and segment fault, okay? So what we talked about a second ago was page fault. Page fault, okay, page fault is, okay, don't want that. Okay, page fault is when a pro, a, a, a page is valid, but not present. It's on the hard drive. It's gotta be brought into the physical memory. That's referred to as a page fault. Then there's also, people confuse these a lot. There's this idea of seg fault or segment fault. People refer to it as segment fault or, or seg fault. Segment fault is when you access an invalid piece of memory. And it gets its name from the old days when people used it should it, it sh, well it, it it it's kind of the, the terminology has to do a lot more with history than anything else. Page fault is okay. Segment fault's bad. Segment fault means you're accessing a segment that isn't there, but it, it isn't accessing a segment that isn't there. It's accessing the memory that's not in any segment. So it's a little bit misnamed. A segment fault when you access a free part of memory, a part of your virtual memory space that is not in use. It's, it's marked invalid. His, for historic reasons, that one's referred to as a segment fault. When you access a page that's valid, but still on the hard drive and hasn't been copied into physical memory yet, that's called page fault. Okay. So we use the word segment fault even when we're talking about pages, but we use the word segment fault to mean you access memory that isn't uh, valid, okay? And, and the terminology is stuck around for decades and, and it's confusing as heck. And there's, you'll see a lot of questions about this. People ask a lot because segment faults and page faults get kind of, you know, which one's, which one's okay and which one's bad. Segment faults crash your program. Page faults just mean you have to copy something from physical, from the hard drive into physical memory. Page faults happen all the time. In, oh, and let me show you in, um, in task manager, If I go over here to the details view, this column here, PF stands for page fault. That's the page fault delta column. This program here, Zoom, is causing 2,000 page faults every second. That means every second, Zoom is accessing 2,000 pages in its virtual memory space that are on the hard drive and not on the uh, in physical memory. What that's doing, it's, it's basically copying frames of video and it's, it's, it's accessing frames of video and it's, you know, it, it's, it's doing it by, by creating a huge amount of a memory that is supposedly video and the memory is on the hard drive. And then as it wants to write pages into the video frames, the frames get copied into physical memory so it could fill them. Then they get copied back to the hard drive. So it's kind of a weird process, but you can see that the program's doing 2,000, very consistently, 2,000 page faults every second. And there are some other programs that are page faulting a lot too, okay? See, this program's consistently doing
doing, this is the page fault delta. So that means that's how many page faults there are every second. There's another column for total number of page faults. Page faults are okay. Segment, pay, uh, segment faults are bad. They just crash your program. So let's see, where's the page fault? Oh, page, this column here just tells me the total number of page faults. Okay, so Zoom has page faulted 3 million times since it started up. Okay, this other program has page faulted half a billion times almost since it started up. Okay. Okay, so programs page fault all the time. Page faulting is normal. Segment faulting crashes your program. So segment fault is when you, if you touch one of these invalid pages, you touch the page you know, that, that's here, I've denoted as free. There's a, there's a lot of different words you could put here. Free, unused, invalid, um, uh, whatever. You know, it's, a, it's a frame that's not supposed to be part of your program yet. Okay. Now let's look at this other process. This other process, similar idea here that when this process is turned to run, first, when it's, when it's initially loaded into memory, the operating system will say, okay, let's put the code page goes here. Okay, that's code one page. And maybe we'll put the uh, stack here. Okay, and put the heap down here. Okay, and then the code page will be denoted as present or valid, it's valid, oops, okay, but it's initially not present, but we'll do the same thing. It's just over here in the hard drive, okay, okay, and now suppose there's another, there's two code pages, so I'll put the other code page here, okay, so that page will be also marked as It's valid, but it's not present. Now, but it is on the hard drive. So this code page is on the hard drive at sector six, and the other one's at the hard drive on sector seven, okay? The stack will, let's suppose the operating system decides to put the stack of that program over here. Okay, so I picked a free frame, put the stack. So the stack now is in, frame zero and it is present and it's it's valid and present because it's actually been allocated in memory. Remember the, the stack's not part of your exe file. So the what goes in the stack is not stored on the hard drive. What's stored in the hard drive is mostly just the exe, the executable, the binary code, not the, the data like the stack and the heap. So when you load this program into memory, the the code can come from the hard drive, but the stack just gets created in, in, in memory for the program to be ready to use it. Same with the heap. The heap is basically just be empty at first, but it's gonna be allocated. Let's say, let's put the heap here. Okay, so the heap now is in, so this is gonna be in frame two. It's valid and it is present in physical memory, okay? Now, this one is going to be invalid, and this one is invalid, okay? These, these two are free, they're marked as invalid, okay? Now, this program starts executing. So here, the main method supposed here is in code one. As soon as it starts executing, the operating system goes over here and says, oh, I need to access this page. And it realizes it's not present. So now the operating system has another page fault. So the operating system says, oh, it's not present. I can't execute something off the hard drive. Before I can execute it, I have to copy it into physical memory. So now the operating system has to find a place for code one. So let's suppose it puts it there, puts it there. So now this is gonna get changed to being present, it's valid now and now it's present in page 
Where did I put it? Four. Okay, I put it in page four. Okay, now here's what's interesting. This program is executing that code. The, the program may stay in that code for quite a while without needing page two, this code two. This code two will stay on the hard drive. It'll remain invalid until the program actually jumps into there. Okay, this is part of the, the why it's called demand paging. Earlier I told you this is called demand paging. You don't get pages in physical memory until you demand that they be there, until you actually need them. The, the reason this is really useful is this program could be quite large. This program could actually need lots of code pages, but maybe rarely need some of them. So maybe the program actually has a code page three and a code page four, but code pages three and four are almost never used, okay? They won't get, they, in fact, this program could actually not, they could, the code pages three and four aren't even gonna be put into the virtual memory space unless this program asks for them. That's like the idea, remember the overlays? We talked about overlays. Code pages three and four, they could be set up so that this program doesn't even put them in virtual memory until it asks for them. You know, maybe this code handles some sort of error condition or this code handles some sort of other error condition. And so it wouldn't be until this code here notices that it needs to handle something special that it could ask for this code to be brought into virtual memory and then brought into physical memory, okay? So this is referred to as demand paging because Right now, code two is in virtual memory. It's still on the hard drive. It's still invalid. And until this program branches into that section of memory, this page will remain invalid. But as soon as this code jumps into there, that's a page fault. That'll just trigger the process of copying code two somewhere in memory, marking it as present. And then the program just continues on running. So the program, the CPU could cause a page fault. And when CPU causes a page fault, the CPU doesn't even realize that this is happening. It, it just triggers something in the operating system where the operating system essentially puts the program in a block state. When, when a program causes a page fault, it actually enters the block state. It's just like doing an IO operation. It's just a, it's a fancy kind of IO operation. It's an IO operation that the program triggers without even realizing it. When this program jumps to this section here, it'll actually be requesting that this block from the hard drive be copied into memory. So that's an IO operation. The operating system realizes that, puts this process in a block state, does the IO operation, which is handling called the page fault handler. The IO operation will copy code two into some place in physical memory. After it's copied into some frame in physical memory, the operating system will update the page table here to update this to be present. And they'll say what page this is in. And then it'll put the process that was in the block state in the ready state, ready to start running right where it page faulted. The page fault essentially just temporarily blocks the program without it even knowing it, just like it did an IO operation. And the program will be blocked until the page fault gets handled. From that point of view over here, when a program is page faulting, every time it page faults, it's essentially doing an IO operation. Okay, so page faults slow your program down. Okay, you know, but, and, and see, but Zoom is using so much memory because it's, it's cranking through so much data to be constantly storing the video frames in, mem in, in the hard drive that it's using the page faults as this way to write data to the hard drive. Okay, so it's just page faulting. That's its, that is its IO operation. So the page faulting here is essentially just its way of doing IO. Okay. Other programs, they tend to page fault only when they wanna jump to new code. Like if this program jumped from this code page to this code page, that would cause a page fault. Then when this thing jumped back into here and this one, if there was some like a loop or, or function calls that went back and forth, this thing only page faults one time. When this thing is brought into physical memory, it's not gonna page fault again, okay? All right. Now. This is referred to as demand paging. When a program, virtual memory can have pages that are allocated to it, okay, meaning that they're valid, but they're not present. They won't be made present until you actually, what we say, touch them, okay? 
Now let's look at the homework assignment and you can see what you can, we can actually watch this happen. We can watch something transition from being present and not valid to being, I'm sorry, from being valid and not present to being valid and present. We can watch a page fault happen, okay? So go to the homework assignment. Let's go to the homework assignment. And we'll, we'll use the demo program to do this, okay? So, I'm going to run the demo version. Okay. Now, what I have here is a program. And if you think about it in terms of like this picture over here, I've got what I'm looking at in here is the virtual memory space. I'm looking at a picture of my program's virtual memory space. I can't see its page table and I can't see the physical memory space, but I can see the program's virtual memory space. Okay. Now a program over here has millions of pages. It's a, uh, it's a 32, we're, this is running as if Windows was a 32 bit operating system. To keep things kind of simple, these are 32 bit addresses over here. Okay. And in a 32 bit addressing space, the last three, digits here, the last three hexadecimal digits are the offset in a page. They're the offset. The three, because that's 12 bits. 12 bits is 4,000 bytes. So the last 12 bits are the last three hexadecimal digits. Okay, so that's the offset. So then the other decimal digits, the hexadecimal digits, these chose pages. Oh, actually it would be Those choose pages. Three hexadecimal digits, 12 bits, choose offset. And then the next 20 bits, that's five hexadecimal digits, those 20 bits choose the page frames, the, the, the uh, pages. So that means there's two to the 20 pages, which is uh, two million of them. But, well, two to the 20 would be a million. Okay. So remember, two to the 10 is a thousand, two to the 20 is a million. So there is a million page frames, a, a million pages, okay? But you only get half of them because uh, Windows takes your virtual memory space and cuts it in half. You get the lower half, the upper half it reserves for the operating system. So out of this whole virtual memory space in Windows, the top half is, go to, is, is kernel space and the bottom half is user space. So out of these, bits here, we only get, there's 20 bits here, but actually we can only use 19 of them. We can use 19 bits to choose uh, pages, okay? So this just shows us, so at this address, there's a chunk of free memory. Now that's up here at address zero. You actually can't use that memory. The addresses starting at zero are also reserved for the operating system. So you, you, you can't touch memory at, at, at starting at location zero. Now here's one page, see 4,000 bytes. That's a page sitting by itself. There's a, there's a bunch of free unused memory, one page sitting there, then some free memory, then another page, then a bunch of free memory. Then here's a block of pages. See, it's, it's 65,000 bytes, not 4,000 bytes. So that's a block of pages. I think that's uh, eight pages, okay? Is it, we'll see. No, it's 16 pages. That's 16 pages, okay? Then there's a whole bunch more memory. Now these are actually contiguous, but they don't have the same properties. These block of pages are read on, are read write. These are only are read only. For whatever they're being used for, the, this here's a block of 16 pages that are read and write, but here's a block of a whole bunch more pages, I'm not sure how many that is, that are read only. If you write to one of those pages, the program will crash. So that's another bit you can put over here in the page table. You can put a bit here that denotes that a page is what its access is, whether it's a read page, a read write page, or an execute page. So there are more bits over here in the page table entry. So each page can be denoted as like it's done here. See read only, read write. If you go far down, you'll see some other pages, uh, execute read, uh, write copy, read only, read write, write copy, execute read. Uh, here's one special called page guard, okay? 
that's actually page guard is used at the in a, where there's a stack. And we'll talk about it maybe a little bit later. Page guard would be mean that this is guarding a stack so that when you get to the it's the last page in the stack, it guards the end of the stack. When you touch that page, it means it's time to grow the stack. So in this case, it's probably a stack that's, well, it's hard to know if it's a stack growing down or growing up. It's hard to know if, if this is the stack and it grows down to that page guard, or if this is the stack and it grows up to that page guard. So it's, it's hard to tell from here, but that page guard guards the, the end of the stack. If a program touches that page guard, the, uh, that, that signals to the program that it's time to go ask for more pages to grow the stack, okay? So these every page, every page in memory has can be uh, given properties. Okay, so read, write. Okay, now here's a big, huge chunk of free memory. This this is this is a massive chunk of free memory. What what Windows does is, if it takes your, if you think of your virtual memory space as being real big. Okay, if I draw like a. Um, If I think of memory as being real big, let me just. If that's my virtual memory space, this is this is two gigabytes in size. Okay. This is going to be two gigabytes down here. Okay. And this is zero up here. That's my virtual memory space. Okay, what when Microsoft, what Windows does, it puts a little bit of your stuff up here. Let's puts a, it puts a little bit of stuff up here and a little bit of stuff down here and leaves a massive free region in between. This is a mass, if you, if you look at, this is nearly two gigabytes in size. There's just a little bit of, all this stuff here is just a tiny, it's not that much memory. It's a few megabytes of memory. And then all this stuff down here is a few megabytes of memory down here. My executable code is somewhere up here. My actual executable program is somewhere up here, okay? And down here is just some stuff, bookkeeping stuff that the operating, this, all this stuff down here is bookkeeping stuff that the operating system's keeping track of. And then there's this massive hole that, that you can use, you can do anything you want with. Like Zoom would use this massive hole for storing video frames. Yeah, you know, it can it could load up to like a gigabyte of video in memory if it wanted to. Okay, my computer has eight gigabytes of memory. Zoom could actually ask for a whole gigabyte of memory here in this intermediate space to be for, for manipulating video frames, and that's used probably what it does. That's probably what it's when it's page faulting like crazy. It's probably using this region in here as massive amounts of memory in here to, to store video frames, okay? So this picture here, there's a bunch of stuff that's really just a sliver of your virtual memory space up here and a bunch of stuff, which is another sliver of your virtual memory space down here and a big, huge empty hole. And if you, if you do the arithmetic here, you'll see that that's just a little bit under two gigabytes. That's just a little bit under two gigabytes just sitting there, okay? And the middle of it is at address uh, uh, 70000. Roughly 7000 is the middle of this, okay? In fact, if you look in the homework assignment page, I have these, this sample commands you could send to the virtual memory system. That address is about the middle of this region here, okay? That address there is in about the middle of this thing here, okay? So for example, if I take this command and I give it to my program over here, okay, it's asking to Oops. Oh, I think maybe I did have the wrong address in there. Did you see, did I have? Hmm. 
Mitra. Hmm. No, I've, I've drawn but I forgot. I thought I had the right address in that file. I wanted to put something in the middle of this. I wanted to put something right in the middle of this. Did it the other day in class. Now, let's see. The commands look like this. Oops. So the when you the first number on the command is how much time to wait before issuing the command. So that lets you like give you you can issue the command then go and switch to over here to see it before it happens. So you, you can give yourself a few seconds to switch from here to here. So the first thing in the command is the how much time. This is what operation you want to do. This was a one that was reserve a region of memory, okay? That was supposed to make it show up here as a reserved, right? Uh, uh, see the word reserve here? That was supposed to make a, a, a section memory show up as reserved, okay? And then the next at is where to do it. Then how much memory, the how much memory would be these sizes here, how much, how, how much memory to create. And then the access here encoded the whether it's read, write, or read only. Okay, so that would be down here. Um, see, page read only, read write, execute, execute, read. Okay. Okay. Oh, there it happened. Oh, I wonder, I think I had this thing blocked. Oh, I think I did something dumb. I think I actually blocked this one. When I clicked on it, I, um, I yeah, when I clicked on this window, that actually pauses this window, so it no longer accepts output, which is done. It, it, I forgot about that. When you click on a window, the window no longer accepts output. Okay, so then you have to like you have to hit the enter key, and now the window accepts output. Let me start this over again. You can see what I mean. Okay, so I was I, I blocked myself from seeing what was happening. Okay, so run the demo program. Okay, run the demo program. Okay. Get this command. Issue the command. See, I split that region in half. Okay. So that re that command at address 40000, that was See this region here that was right about in the middle of that big huge block. So these are about two equal size. I, I just about split that huge equal block. So I just allocated something right smack in the middle of my virtual memory space. So now I have a big empty block above it and a big empty block below it. Little bit of I have a little bit of memory in use up here, a little bit of memory in use down here, and a little bit of memory in the middle, and a huge block between them. So now there's a huge block here and a huge block here and a little bit. So now I have just like over here, I have a little sliver of memory going on in here, little sliver like that. Okay, so unused here, unused here, a little sliver here, okay? Now, in terms of our picture before, Okay, in terms of this picture, what I've just done is I've said to Windows that there's a certain section of virtual memory that I plan to use. And this, this idea of reserving is not part of this theory. 
So it's not mentioned in the textbook. The reserve thing is something that only Microsoft does. Linux doesn't do it. It's essentially a weird state where I've told the operating system that, for example, say this block here, this free. I've told the operating system that I plan to use it, but that has no effect on the page table. It only says that I plan to use that free block later on. That's called reserving it. Okay, so it's reserved over here. And uh, th you'll see no mention in the textbook about the idea of reserve, because this was a Microsoft idea. And it's, I'm not even sure why they really thought it was necessary. Linux doesn't do it. And it just, it's just, you're, you have to tell the operating system that this block of virtual memory, you plan to do something with it later on. Okay, now at some point you actually want to make it into real memory. You want it to be valid, okay? In, the, in its terminology of Windows, making it valid is this command here, commit. They call it commit. When you commit memory, you make it valid. So reserve just says, I plan to use it. You can't commit until you've reserved. So you have to reserve first, then you can commit. Reserve just puts the block in a kind of weird state, has nothing to do with the page table. It just tells the operating system that you plan to use that page of virtual memory. You cannot commit a page of virtual memory until after you've reserved it, but the reserve has nothing to do with the page table. Okay, when you commit a block, you're telling the operating system, oh, okay, let's, let's commit this block here. We're, you're telling the operating system that this block here, oh, I have to, to commit it, I have to open it in the um, paint so I can paint over it. So let's do a commit on in, a, in the picture and then see, think about how, what watch it happen in the program, okay? Okay, suppose that my program wants to commit this free block page two. So it issues, in Windows, it would issue the commit function call, okay? And that would then change this to I'm going to change it for, I'm going to make it a data. I'm going to just make it some data. So I'm going to suppose that I put some data in here. So it's just going to be some data. Okay. Well, when I ask for it to be committed, the operating system has to do the following. It's okay. Page two is now going to become valid. But it should also be present so I can make use of it. So we're going to make it present. So over here, the operating system has to find some place to put it. So maybe it puts it here, there. So that'll be in page seven. Okay. So now page two has been committed to physical memory. Okay. But at this point, it's, oh, I should have to be careful. It's committed. But it's um, it's actually initially. Ah, I yeah. Let me just step back for a minute. This is not what it does. It doesn't put it over here. It initially puts it over here on the hard drive in this area called the swap space. So what it does is it actually says, "Well, you haven't told me that you really need to use it yet. So what I'll do is I'm going to." allocate it to the hard drive and make it not present. So I'll put your data over here on the hard drive in the swap space. So it's over here. That data is shows up over here, okay? So what I've told the operating system is, commit this page of virtual memory. So the operating system, oh, and then this number here has to be the number of the block. So now this is gonna be a 10. It's 10 because it's valid, but not present. If it's valid and not present, it's on the hard drive. So then this should take what block it's on the hard drive, okay? The operating system, that's what it, in the demand paging system, when you ask for something to be committed, in the case of in Windows or Linux, when you ask it to be committed, it commits it to the hard drive, okay? So it gives you a block 
on the hard drive, which is sometimes referred to as virtual memory. This is what people some, this is what people erroneously refer to as virtual memory down here. So essentially I created a piece of virtual memory because it's over here on the hard drive. Okay. All right. So I've now this is what the commit step step does. The commit step gives you a present, a valid but not present block. So over here, commit means you have a block that's valid but not present. It's actually allocated on the swap space, on the hard drive, okay? At some point, the program will say, I wanna read that data, or I wanna write something to that block. I'm gonna write some data to there. So the program writes data to there. As soon as it accesses that, the operating system says, well, wait a minute, it's not present in physical memory. We need, this is, we should, before we write to it, we need to make it present in physical memory. It won't, it won't actually treat the hard drive as actual memory. So it won't write data down here. It will not read data from down here and it won't write data from down here. If this is actually supposed to be a page of virtual memory, it's never gonna be accessed down here. It has to be copied over here before it can be accessed. So after this program commits this thing here, after it's been committed, it then accesses it. The first time it accesses it, it gets a page fault because it's present, but it's valid, but not present. When it page faults, that's when the operating system says, oh, I have to find a place for it over here. So now the operating system will say, okay, we'll take this block and move it over here. So now we'll move it into physical memory at page seven. So then we have to update the page table. Now this is page frame seven. And now we say that this thing is, it goes from being not present to being present. That's a page fault. Okay. So when you commit the, memory, the block of memory, it becomes valid, but not present but it isn't actually in physical memory yet. It's just on the swap space. It isn't until you touch it. And that's why over here, we have a separate command for touch. Touch just means read that piece of memory, okay? Read it so that we actually access it. Touching it, if it's, if it's valid, but not present, touching it page faults it. If it's valid and present, touching it just reads it. So the very first time you touch something after you commit it, that causes a page fault. Okay, now we can watch that happen. What, you know, if we set up enough, we can watch that happen over here. Okay. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is my next command in this file here, this one takes one of those pages I allocated and commits it. So two, is command for commit. So I'm gonna commit one of those pages. Okay, so I'm gonna issue the command. Then over here, you'll see that one of the, there's a, bu a bunch of pages there. One of them's about to become, see, one of them, well, actually I committed four pages there. I committed four, see that's 16,000 bytes. So I committed, actually committed four pages. So I committed four pages. Now notice that I, I put it in the middle of my reserve region. So I've got some reserve memory that I've got committed. Now reserve doesn't really mean anything. Reserve just means I've told the operating system I might use that memory later on. So right now there's one page of reserve memory, four pages of committed. Now at this point, I haven't touched them. So I know right now that they're valid, but they're not present yet. And then I have some more reserve pages down here. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to touch one of those blocks. Okay. Now the touch command is command three. Okay, now I didn't have that here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here and, and build a touch command. So I'm going to wait five seconds. I'm going to touch the page at four. copy that and paste it because if I mess up and get the wrong number of zeros, I won't know where I am, okay? And I'm gonna touch one page 
okay, with the same memory access. Now, to see the page happen, the touch happen, I need three programs. Here's the program that's going to issue the command. Here's the program that shows me virtual memory. And then I need task manager to show me the page fault. See if I can get it up here. I need task manager. The program I'm running is this one. This is the program that's going to page fault, VM driver demo. This is the program that's actually going to page fault. Put them in alphabetical order. See, there's the program that's going to page fault. And there's the column for page fault deltas. Now I'll see. Now you have to try to, yeah, with one window, you have to see if we can get these all mapped, you know. Okay. There's the page fault delta column right there. Okay, so it's highlighted. There's the program that's going to actually page fault. And here's where I type in my command. Okay. If I type in my command here, I should, I won't see anything happen over here because this thing is going to stay committed, but I should see that thing turn to a one. See that little digit there, the zero for page fault delta, that should turn to a one. And then the number of page faults should increase from 1,131 to 1,332. So I should see one more page fault. Okay. So now I'm going to Did you see the change? Zero changed the one, okay? I touched that page. Nothing happened over in this window. This window doesn't show anything, but this thing, and then the, see, that thing incremented by one. I actually page fault, I page faulted a page. In, I mean, I, if I could have seen inside the CPU, you would have seen the CPU do this whole process of act, updating the page table. It, it, it went through this whole process now, it, it took, a page that was in the swap space, copied it into physical memory, updated the page table. Okay, all that happened in, when I issued that one command. I can do it again. So I'll do. I'll touch the next page. So now I'll touch the next page over. Okay. Remember, these three digits are the digits that are offset within a page. This digit here is the first page. Is the number of the page. So if I increase that from one to two. I'm going to access page two. Okay. So that'll cause now that path, I haven't touched. Oh, uh, actually, let me go back and do one again. If I touch that same page, it's not going to cause a page fault anymore. See, that didn't cause a page fault because I've already page faulted that in. So touching that page again doesn't cause another page fault. Now let me touch the page next to it. Okay, now I'm gonna to touch the page next to it. Wait five seconds. See, there was the page fault. Okay, so I got one more page fault. Because I now if I touch that page again, nothing's gonna happen. Because when I touch that same page again, it's already been page faulted. So I'm not gonna see another page fault. Now I, can, I allocated four pages originally, so let me touch the next page. So let me touch the third of the four pages I allocated. There's the page fault. Okay, I saw the page fault delta. Then we do the, uh, that was one, there's one more to out, I, there's one more that I could pick, touch. Watch over here, you'll see there's the page fault, okay? Showed up after five seconds. Now, if I step through memory and touch another page, if I step through memory and touch another page, I've now touched all four of these committed. The reserved is actually not valid memory. If I step through memory and touch one more page, I'm gonna crash my program. I'm gonna change from a page fault to a segment fault. So now I'm about to touch a page that doesn't exist. What happened? Where did my program go? See, the program crashed. 
It did a segment fault. It touched the pay you know, over here. You know, th this program, the access denied is the memory mapper saying, I can't find that program I'm supposedly mapping. The memory mapper was mapping the program that just crashed. So the memory mapper is giving me an error message. This is the last time it was able to see what was in memory. And right now it's giving me this vir virtual query access, it's access denied. It's actually not access denied. What it is is that the process is no longer there anymore. The process died. So the memory mapper, the memory mapper is trying to map a process that's no longer in memory. Okay. But what happened was we touched all four of these committed pages here. Then we touched the next page down, which was reserved. In our picture over here, we said that reserved doesn't really mean anything. From the point of view of the page table, reserved is the same thing as free. Okay, so when you touch a reserved page, your program crashes. That's a segment fault. Okay, all right. So we can watch with with the right number of programs and the right number of setting things up. You can actually watch the operating system do exactly what we're talking about over here. You can watch page faults happen. Okay, so. Okay, this one, we just close it now. There's nothing to map, okay, All right? So that's, the, that's what this homework assignment is about, is you, you can issue commands. You know, these are the commands you can issue. You can, well, reserve is just, Microsoft makes you do this. Yeah, so um, it's, it's, it's kind of annoying. Microsoft makes you reserve regions of memory before you can do the real work. The real work is committing. From our point of view, committing is actually saying, oh, I want this page of memory to be, valid. But when you commit, you become valid in the, the swap space on the hard drive. The operating system is real conservative. Just because you say that you want, you might use that memory doesn't mean you really are going to use that memory. So when you say, I want that chunk of memory to be committed, the operating system just assumes that, well, you may use it, you may not. So let's put it on the hard drive because physical memory is more valuable than hard drive space. So it doesn't want to allocate physical memory until it knows for sure it has to, because especially in the old days, physical memory was very valuable. Nowadays, you, you can buy 32 gigabytes of physical memory with pretty cheaply. We're, we're actually entering a new era of computing. Physical memory is nowhere near as valuable as it used to be. And in the future, some of this theory might change because this theory was actually built on the idea that physical memory is way more valuable than uh, the dr this drive. So much of this is based on the idea that you don't want to commit something to the physical memory until you know for sure it's going to be used. So when you tell Microsoft to commit memory, same thing with Linux, it will initially just make it valid, but not present. And it'll actually put your block on the swap space. Oh, actually, let me show you where the swap space is on your computer. Okay, You can see the swap space in Windows. The swap space is a sec special section of the hard drive that's used for storing pages that are not yet committed to the physical memory. Okay. Now over here, if you open up the C drive, see this file here, swap file. Okay. Now, normally, if you see that's that that file is slightly grayed out, it's actually a hidden file. So like over here, if I go, oops. If I click on view and I click on view options and click on view options here, you'll see that I have where is it? Oh yeah, show hidden files and folders. Normally Windows says don't show hidden files and folders. Normally that's checked. But I checked that for this for teaching classes. So I say show hidden files and folders, okay? So if you open up your C drive, you probably won't see that file swap space, swap space dot sys, swap file dot sys. But if you turn on hidden files, you'll see it, okay? Now, if you click on its properties, I don't think it tells you it's a hidden file, okay? Okay, so it's a fairly large file. See, it's a quarter of a gigabyte. And that's the, that's the space that Windows is currently using on the hard drive for holding things that are present but not val or that for holding things that are valid but not present when something is valid but not present it's in the swap file okay okay 
And in my case, the swap file is a quarter of a gigabyte in size. You can turn, you can, you can actually turn that swap file off if you want. Here's something that's annoying about the world of like Stack Overflow. You can look up, how do you turn off virtual memory? How to disable virtual memory. This is very messed up here. There is no such thing as turning off virtual memory. Okay. Turning off virtual memory would mean turn off the memory management unit. The memory management unit cannot be turned off. It's always on. Your computer is always using virtual memory. You have a virtual memory space here, and you have a physical memory space here, and you have a page table that translates from virtual memory space to physical memory space. That's what our textbook is about, okay? What you can turn off and on is the swap space. You can turn off the swap space. Now, if you turn off the swap space, that means that every time you want something to be committed, it's committed directly to the physical memory. Now, it's not committed to the swap space first, and then it is page faulted into physical memory you can turn off the swap space. Whenever people talk about how to turn off virtual memory, you should know as a computer scientist that what they really mean is turning off the swap space, not turning off virtual memory, okay? You cannot turn off virtual memory. It's built into the CPU. It's just part of the CPU. But people always, you know, there's huge numbers of pages, how to disable virtual memory in Windows 10, how to turn off virtual memory, okay? Every once in a while, somebody gets it right. What is the Windows page file? Okay, what you're really talking about is, you know, in here, why turning off virtual memory doesn't improve the computer? Well, somebody here is explaining that because you're really not doing anything. You're just turning off this hard drive thing over here, which, which doesn't really change much, okay? Especially if you have 32 gigabytes of physical memory. If you have 32 gigabytes of physical memory, you're hardly ever using this swap space anyway because there's just so much physical memory in your computer that the operating system pretty much, if it sees that there's lots of free memory over here, when you commit, it will usually commit straight to physical memory. Okay, so the, 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 th this is kind of a weird thing about learning about virtual memory, that if you Google the phrase virtual memory and you try to read what people tell you about virtual memory on the internet, a lot of times what they're talking about is the swap space, not about what we're talking about which is this page table system. The page table system of virtual memory versus physical memory with a page table in the memory management unit, that's what we mean by virtual memory. In the operating systems community, if you use the phrase virtual memory, you mean this process of using page tables. The, the virtual memory system can make use of a swap space if you want it to. You don't have to. You can turn off the swap space, and then that just means that the the present bit is just gonna be always one. That if something is valid, then it's always present, okay? So you would just have valid, you know, you, whenever you made something valid, you automatically make it present and you, and you allocate it in physical memory, okay? And, and that pretty much is, that's still virtual memory. It's just virtual memory without a swap space, okay? And Microsoft will let you turn off the swap space. You can delete that file and not use it. So it's usually, it's not really a good idea and it's, it's not worth the effort. And there, a whole bunch of people write about this as if it was something important. And it, it's the, the people writing about it are usually, they don't understand, they don't understand this. They don't understand, understand the real virtual memory and don't realize what small role the swap space plays in it. And it's not a particularly important uh, aspect of it. And you, it's better to leave it on. There, there's almost no advantage to turning off the swap space. I'm not even sure why Microsoft even still lets you do that. You know, they still they still let you, you know, disable what you call what they call disabling virtual memory. Okay. Okay. But don't do it. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, you can read about it. Notice that here's how to manage virtual memory. And then in parentheses it says page file. You're not managing virtual memory. You're just managing this one file here. You can control how big it is, for example. Okay. And uh, it used to be called page file. Now it's called swap file. At some point, micro it, so this is probably a little bit of an older page because they don't call it page file anymore. It's actually called swap file.sys. Okay. All right. So we run out of time. So on, on, on Wednesday, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about these examples, we'll do some more examples of playing around with the, with the, with the, the demo program. Remember, the, so what we've seen now is that the, like 
these three commands in the demo program, reserve, commit, and touch. Remember, reserve doesn't play any role in the theory. It's just a Microsoft thingy. Commit is the thing that says, make my page pre valid, but not present. Then touch makes it present. You know, once, you know, the first time you touch it, you page fault it to make it present. So valid, but not present, make it present, okay? So those are the, those are the three most important commands. And then on Thursday, we'll talk what it means to lock and unlock, okay? And what guard page, we'll, we'll say a little bit about these. These are not used all that much, okay? Oh, and then decommit is when you wanna just start unloading pages from memory. It's the opposite of committing. Yeah, just decommitting is when you just say, oh, I'm done with this data. You can just throw it away from physical memory. I'm not gonna use it anymore. So you freeing up, that's decommitting is actually literally freeing physical memory. That's the equivalent of freeing. Okay, so we'll quit there. Okay. And we'll play around with these examples. You know, and um, hopefully these pictures give you a sense of how to think about this. Because like, like I say, the book doesn't really draw too many pictures. The book just explains this in a lot of words. Where is it? Oh, the book explains it in a lot of words. They, they don't draw too many pictures. Like they, they just have this one kind of, yeah, see, it's mostly words. Okay, and almost all the operating systems books are like that. They make they tend to use a lot more words. I'm hoping that these pictures can supplement the words and give you a little bit better feel for what's going on. Okay, all right. So let's we'll quit there, and okay. And I'll try to put the uh, the review problems for 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 virtual memory up by this evening. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Stop sharing. Meet again on Wednesday. Professor, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, do you have a question? No, I sent you an email as if we can meet after the class. So oh, yeah. 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 Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. What do you want to do? Do you want to uh, go to the office hour Zoom meeting? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Bye bye.